Hello everyone, I'm Alex and I'm the Senior Film Academy Events Program and Festival Manager. You're about to watch a recording of a BFI Film Academy Lab session all about producing for film and television. BFI Film Academy Labs are all about helping 16 to 25 year olds break into the screen industries. These monthly practical sessions are led by industry professionals with a focus on explaining the specifics of working in film and television and developing your skills to become the best screen creatives you can be. The labs are programmed across three strands, which are storytelling, business of film, and career ladder. We hope you enjoyed today's session. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Regina Bob. As Alex said, I'm a production manager, and I'm very happy to host this session for you today. We have on our panel two amazing and incredible industry professionals who have achieved so much and have kindly given their time to help you succeed. They run a fantastic multi-award winning production company called Mini Productions, which they co-founded 12 years ago. Since starting the company, they have produced various shorts, features, charity films, branded content, virals and music videos for clients alike, and now have slates in development in film and TV. They have also taken the festival circuit by storm by having their own short films programmed at various film festivals internationally. A huge warm welcome to the queens, yes, the queens of TV and film, TV producer and line producer, Sarah Huxley, and of course the wonderful film extraordinaire, April Kelly, actor, writer, and producer. But before we get into oh. it, oh yeah, no, go for it. Oh, I was like, I'm embarrassed go already. On. What intro? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> but before we get into it, let's take a little look at the mini productions showreel, and that's showcasing their work as part of their 10 year anniversary. Today's the day. You don't question an officer's decision. You just get on with it. If I could take you to a place where our worries would erase, or we'd leave this world behind. I bet if I was a lesbian, this wouldn't have even happened. And if I was a dude, it'd be a non fucking issue. Forever, because I love you. But the second, the second that you lie down and give up, and I'm sorry, but that's the second that I lie down and I die next time. Yesterday. Oh, listen, forget about it. That's gone. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's gone. Doors open. Thank you. was incredible everybody round of applause yeah <laughs> so how are you doing ladies how are you doing yeah really good thank good. you really well <laughs> oh good I'm glad I'm so glad so tell us a bit about your background Sarah I know you 
I know if you could go first, basically, I know you are basically TV line producer, TV production, that's your speciality. How yeah. did you guys get into it? And what has been your experiences to date? Um, well, we'll probably talk about it more, but the first everything started from mini um it started with april and i making short films i went to drama school over 10 years ago and trained as an actor and started producing theater um because one of my teachers said i think you could be a producer but i didn't know what a producer was i had no idea um i grew up in like a tiny village in shropshire and didn't know anyone in the industry didn't have any contacts um met April and we started making short films together and on short films you know you have no money and you have very little resources and you kind of have to do everything yourself so I actually learned how to line produce and all of the business side of um, making film and tv content by just well in shorts because it's kind of a real hard lesson in doing everything and going through the motions um, and running a budget and making a budget and raising finance. So um, my first line producing job was uh, we'd finished a short, which was part of that showreel called Edith, um, which was the biggest short we'd ever made um, and with the biggest budget. And uh, I was looking for work and honestly, an amazing woman in film and TV, her name's Faiza Tovey, she's the production exec at ITV now. Um, she took a risk on me with an amazing producer called Lindsay Hughes. And I sort of sat down and told Lindsay everything I've been doing on our films and everything that I'd sort of learned along the way. And she was like, I think you can line produce. I just know you can do it. So, and we'll talk more about it, that network of women and people that can support you moving up. But I'd never sat in a conventional production office, which most of the, my production team that work under me now do I've never sat under a line producer and, and been like a production assistant a, you know a prod sec a co-ord I just I went in at a higher level because I'd had to do everything myself and um my mum's from a family of accountants and my dad's a farmer so I think it's a good match <laughs> for producers and um line producers but yeah I've, I, I went on and that was a small kid show and then we did show after show after show and I've actually come full circle this year because I'm working I've just finished a big ITV drama as the line producer and co-producer um oh, for uh about the post office scandal and I'm working back with Pfizer again who was that that amazing woman that first took a risk on me so that's it's how I got well, into it isn't it? it yeah it really is it really is and you know those relationships you can keep for a very long time and they can be really fruitful so I'm very Definitely. grateful to her. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much for that. And April, what has your experience been like specifically in film? As I believe that you have got so much experience in film, it's literally <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> it will be good just to understand a bit more about how you first got into the producing element of filmmaking. Um, mm. And also, yeah, what's been your experiences mm. to date? Yeah, so I also trained as an actor. And um, and in my second year of drama school, they made us do a module and a presentation on what we were going to do when we weren't acting that wasn't soul destroying. And um, and I stood up and I presented starting a production company, and I was the only one that uh, that did that. And um, and then my tutor at the end of the session said, uh, pulled me to one side and said, "Did I want to come back next week and present something a little bit more realistic?" So I registered the company two weeks later at the age of 21 <laughs> and started just, you know, piecing together what that looked like. And, um, and at that point, I spent my entire drama school days. I, I worked at a cinema for four, five years. So every weekend I would be in the cinema and I'd be watching how they would, the marketing would come in and out, how they would do the distribution, all of that. And, um, and then as, as I started piecing that together, I also realized what I was lacking and that was the finance plans, like understanding the, the real business element. And so, but what I knew I was good at is, is uh, buying people drinks, mainly coffee at this stage. <laughs> I was still quite young, so I wasn't like uh, liquoring people up, but I then <laughs> started to have meetings with finance directors of production companies in the UK uh, because I just wanted to understand that element. And I tell you what, guys, if there's one 
department that never get asked to have a coffee with it is the finance department of these companies and they're the ones that actually know what's going on in the companies and how they run mm. and how they maintain it um and yeah shortly after all of that I as an only child I was like I don't want to do this by myself I want to find someone that I could go on this journey with and a mutual friend of mine and Sarah's I was having a I was having a couple with him and he said I, I said I like I just want to find I want to find my person in in this and he said oh you should meet Sarah you girls could organize the world together <laughs> and he said I'll introduce you and I went no 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 it's fine it's fine so I found her on Twitter <laughs> and I slid into her DMs and no questions asked she gave me her email address I emailed her and uh, we met for a cup of tea a cup of tea not a drop of alcohol touched our yeah. lips so I meet up with strangers uh, on Twitter apparently that's what we've yeah. learned from this story <laughs> yeah yeah we're very trusting very trusting individuals and um and I, after that my dad had uh some shares in the company for what it was worth at that time but it was good to have someone that was more senior who who'd had experience in that and I was like, Dad, you've lost your shares. And, you know, gave Sarah half the company because if it was going to work, it was going to work if, if we had half the company each and um, and didn't look back. And then since then, my background has been very much more practical and creative driven. And, um, and most recently, I've dipped my toe into the writing side of things, which is what we'll probably go on and explain um, in terms of what our ethos is as a company. And um, uh, yeah, that's it in a long nutshell oh I love it no that's very very interesting and I think you two work very very well together well you must do you've been in business for 12 odd years <laughs> um cool so what was it about each other that makes you a good duo because obviously you know Sarah you're like tv while April you're like film how have you collaborated what is it about each other that you're like yeah this works we both I'm... like rosé yeah, really good drinking. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 when I met April, I'm sitting down th- thinking I've never met someone that works as hard as me. And that's not yeah. in like, a, I work really hard. I just, I've always had this like crazy work ethic and I could yeah. see it in April too. And she had all these ideas and we have a very, very similar like moral compass and attitude towards things. So we work in sync together. And I think we, we agree almost every time on like big decisions and where we want to go and how we treat people and the ethos of our company so that fit like slotted in quite easily but then I think we have quite different skill sets in some ways where we can complement each other so we do a bit of divide and conquer and there's hot like you know production process is such a long process from the very beginnings of an idea right through to delivery and we almost like tag team and we kind of laugh mm. with each other because sometimes I'm like I don't feel like I'm doing much and then I'm like April you're doing all of it at this section and then I'll, and then we'll you know like pass the baton and she's like I don't feel like I'm doing anything I was like well I'm just like doing this thing so it just kind of works because we mm. managed to bring to the table like she April does things that I just like would never do <laughs> or learn like to do boring yeah Yeah. but like she like learns how to edit and I'm just not going to learn how to edit or she'll like the the branding and the website I'm like you do that let me build these budgets so you basically complement each other yeah totally yeah yeah, definitely amazing stuff so let's talk more about actually the role of a producer um from my perspective when I I've worked in tv obviously 15 years and when I first started out I started out in film and music videos so I was a producer, you know, shooting all those like grime videos and stuff like but I learned so much like the budgets were really small, but I learned yeah. so much in terms of like coordination, sourcing stuff, keeping on budget, doing all the paperwork, all the general production bits and pieces. Um, now, there is quite a lot of overlap um, administratively for these roles. What are the different type of producer roles currently within TV and film? And what do you think are the differences or the similarities? Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it really is tailored to what, what that project is. I mean, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with TV, there is more of a structured um set up and and pecking order as you were but with feature films especially independent feature films those roles um can look very different from from a co-producer to an associate producer to an exec and then also to a producer um execs 
within indie films primarily are the ones that are coughing up the cash and um and then it it's I find this is a, a difficult question because in terms of what Sarah and I bring to the table um and the size of the project is is different every time I mean Sarah what what mm. what do you think well, which is which say- is really yeah, no, I would just say from my experience, because so, obviously like we've made our features together and when April and, my, April and I have made features, from a production point of, like, at the produ- as producers, we are kind of doing everything all the time, overseeing everything all the time and can often be integral in the raising of finance. You may go to just a financing company and not have exec producers as such. You might go to mm-hmm. a company who then is like a sales or distributor and wants to help finance it our first film rose actually helped get got financing through the agent of the director there's many ways to raise finance but as producers like you're the person like pushing all the time getting it in the room whereas in tv what i found is it's actually the exec producers who work with the channels and they are at the top of say an indie production company and they are going in having the bigger distribution channel chats and then they'll bring in a producer to actually make the whole show and then a lot of the time in tv um, I found producers have worked their way up, they either work their way up as line producers and co-producers, or they work their way up as writers. And they are like writers, and then they sit in the edit, and all the way through, they're just doing script, 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 script the whole time. So it's an interesting process, because obviously our experience of film, and April's worked on some bigger indie films, but we've also made just our own features, is like, you know... I'd say closest to the role of a mother, like conceiving an idea and then Looking doing everything and then being mm-hmm. all the distribution. And like still with mm. our feature film, we're still doing it. We're still talking about it. And we're still doing the stuff on it. Whereas in TV, it's quite like a little bit more, everyone has their role and you are, um, and yeah, it- and you're supported by a channel who you report to that's and great. they they have the money and they also have the programming slot so it's it's much more focused whereas a film you're like we've made a film now what festivals and what yeah. we're going to do with it also there there are producers if you go on imdb and you see about 20 odd producers on on a film like sometimes people just get a a producing credit if they if they've just been a part of the development side of things you know when you're working mm. in house in these bigger companies someone may have developed that script up to a point had nothing to do with the actual run of the production and distribution but still then gets a producer's credit uh, which is whereas in tv the well the high-end tv i've done there's only ever been a producer and then a co-producer line producer and then a head of production type thing definitely that's really interesting just to hear more about the different types of producers that are out there Mm. um i was going to ask as well obviously producers wear many hats Yes. What's your favourite thing to do as a producer and your <laughs> not so favourite thing to do as a producer as in like, oh my gosh, I have to do that. And, and like, yes, this is the best thing. Or are you literally like, I love producing. There's nothing that... Risk assessments. I hate risk <laughs> assessments. Oh my God. And you are so liable and I cannot stress that enough. We jumped into it and then you get further along. You're like, oh, I'm really liable mm. for everything. I love <laughs> to producer. I do love risk assessments. Obviously, I'm just... <laughs> manager in great that's why you at PM. love it and <laughs> risk assessments are the greatest thing to produce. they are incredible they are incredible and they are so important, important. yeah they're very and important I think for those you know in the audience that are just starting out it's just really important to kind of like listen to the ladies and really understand that producing is a it's a wonderful career and um, whether you want to work in tv or film or both and it's just a matter of learning as much as you can gaining as much experience as you can and Mm. I think that's kind of what you need to do if you really want to make it within the industry Mm -hmm. Mm. okay cool you have to really love it because it's not yeah you have to it's not like friendly on the time and the body and the health like you know it's it's all encompassing you have to love it I hate the early mornings Mm. does not does not agree with me and I'm sure you can relate to that Georgina but with with being bipolar don't, don't get me up at five. Literally, <laughs> we need our sleep. Thing. We need our sleep. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Cool. We'll talk about that later, but let's talk mm. about mini productions as the company. So, you know, how do you choose the projects that you work on as producers? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I guess maybe the 
our first, you know, what we would consider our first uh, short film, T for Two, I and I oh god I nearly swore I forget oh, I can't swear oh my god I'm sorry I uh, <laughs> I stopped myself though um, we actually met that writer director Mark Brennan at a networking event uh, just got chatting with him He's such a sweet guy really interesting to talk to had an interesting idea and then bish bash bosh we did it and that is also actually how we met Jen who we're going to show the chop and who we ended up doing. Um, our debut feature where we met her at a Setica film festival um, so there's a chunk of people we genuinely have met at networking events and then gone on to work and produce so that is very much possible and is very you can do it successfully as well and then um, and then the other ones is is word of mouth like Sarah and I getting matched matched up with writers and directors um, uh, yeah I think that is mainly it isn't it Sarah mm. Yeah, and also just like when a script really sort of sings to you, it's like when you mm. just can't put it down. Mm-hmm. They they're rare. Like you read lots of like okay stuff, and then every now and again you get something really really good, or you get like April was saying, someone that you really want to work with, mm-hmm. and you just think we've got to work on this project together. And it doesn't. It's not always immediate. Like it's always the right things happen at the right mm-hmm. time and slot into place. And even our latest feature, that came from a short film that we made. Um, we made that short Edith with Christian Cook. And, you know, we kept saying, oh, we're going to do a feature, we're going to do a feature. And then he was going to do that feature with someone else. And it was a much bigger budget. And then it fell through. And then suddenly there was just this window of like, we are pitching to these investors and can we make it cheaper? And what does that look like? And could we do it together? And we did. And we got the finance and we made it. And so, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it's just timing, right, right people, right time or projects, you know, being times right when that, actors are available to add to that as well two films in particular um treacle and just in case we'd actually gone to festivals with our films and watched programs of shorts and been really taken back and moved by um by shorts and then and then mm. since then like ended up reaching out to those directors specifically and was like can we talk like can we find something we can work on? Um, and that's the beauty of film festivals, isn't it? April's like the queen of networking. I'm just going to put that out there. And what I would say to young, definitely young filmmakers is like we networked for years. We would go to every, as many film festivals, as many free events, meet as many people as we can. You know, everyone in the BFI Film Academy, you've all got networks. And think mm-hmm. about where you'll be in 10 years time, because it's not the now, it's nurturing and everybody's career is growing. And now like 10 years later, some of the people, Jen Sheridan, who made our first ever feature, I was at Three Mill Studios shooting the ITV drama and she was in another studio just on that complex shooting Extraordinary Series 2 for Disney. And I was like, mm-hmm. Jen, like walking on set with her. And it's mental because it's like, I can't believe you're doing this. She's like, I can't believe I'm doing this. But that <laughs> is... The through line, it's endurance. <laughs> and, and you have to be tenacious as well. You have yeah. to be tenacious with it. You can't be like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I'm passionate about that. I went to a networking event. Like, go to a networking event, speak to people. Yeah. Meet people, you know, straight away. Let people know that you're yeah. free, available for work or you're exactly. got a script or, you know. There's there's a couple hey. of tricks that I, I learned quickly. And I thank my dad for this because he started his own uh, company when he was younger as little Essex boy and um, and he was he just said just never stop asking that person cr- questions so when I was when I was going out and networking um, I, I was like I let can I buy you a coffee or a cup of tea I only need about 20 30 minutes of your time that always turns into an hour because everyone's so polite and at the end of that because we're most majority of people are British and also again polite they were like if you need anything just reach out I'm still dining out on that quite, like, I'm still dining out I'm still going back to people and be like do you remember when you said if I needed anything um but my biggest thing is never stop asking that person cre- questions because um I didn't really have much to say at that age but I had a hell of a lot to learn so yeah that was my yeah. that's fantastic I'm going to show everybody the chop video and then we can have a little chat and discussion about it if that's yeah okay. great Okay, brilliant. Let's go. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I I, I don't know what came over me. I I think I I might have killed her. Wow, okay. 
There's no coming back from this. Is she actually dead? Oh, God. Is this what I am now? A murderer? No, no. No, it was, it was self-defense. Her or me. I really didn't, I really didn't mean to do it. It's just that I'm sorry, but no one is taking my balls. Okay, <laughs> cute dog, cute, the dog, is, I love dogs, I'm literally such an animal person, the dog is the cutest <laughs> in the world, so tell us, what is, what is the chop about, and how did you get to creating such a weird and horror -ish? Yeah, that is, so that's Jen Sheridan, oh. who we made our first feature with, she directed that, and she called us up. As April said, we'd met her at a networking event. We kept saying we were going to work together. And she was like, look, I've got a small amount of money. I've got, I've got Paul, who's a DP, is doing me a favour. Um, I've got, I just want to shoot this idea in a day just for a bit of fun to do a bit of kind of horror, but a mini, mini short and just do it for a bit of fun, Um, you know, on a weekend or whatever. And um, her dog, is that's her dog in it. Um, that's me lying on the floor at the beginning and we just went to a local vets I think in Wandsworth mm. was it Apes or Clapham mm -hmm. and um, and it was just a bit of fun really and just to shoot something because she she was a comedy editor and really wanted to be a director and she thought I need to make some short films because I'm stuck in editing I'm a very good editor I'm working my up and I'm getting boxed as an editor what can I do? And the advice is start making a platform of short films so then she can get repped as a director and she can move into directing. And and that's exactly what she did. Um, you know, we made our first feature film and her first feature film when she got repped by her agent and the money came in to make it. So um, yeah, it just shows the sort of journey of what that short did for her. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's incredible. I'm going to speak now a bit about the the collaboration in terms of relationships between the writers directors and producers on shorts and on features how does that work so how does a writer work with a director or a director work with a producer and what's the importance of the relationship between the three sort of roles as it were um i'm assuming that there may be some people in the audience that are budding writers or budding directors or budding producers so it'll just be good to hear a bit about that so that people can kind of get some more knowledge on that yeah i think for rose we had as sarah said we had um multiple producers on that it, it was it was mini productions development partnership and then great point media actually financed it so theoretically you've got three parties involved there and with that feature Jen directed it but um, Matt Stoko wrote it and he was also in it so again it's very many different ways to skin a cat and there's as a producer it's actually you know no no relationship and no project will ever function the same uh, the same way and it's our job as producers uh, to navigate those relationships and to uh, make sure that that communication and boundaries are clear from from the get go, um, and I think it was an unusual setup and and wonderful on so many levels that we had uh, our writer and actor on on set with us and Jen very much open to suggestions as well as what Matt was because you know having the writer on set and this is probably something I'm going to speak to um, speak to in in a bit uh, you have that ability if something's not working or a scene's not working or something goes wrong he's there to to work with with Jen and make sure that we we can achieve what we needed to achieve for that day um when it comes to embers most recently that was an adaptation of a play so dave uh, adapted his play into a screenplay with christian and christian was actually in the play See, it gets very convoluted. Uh, very yeah, so Christian was later. the director and he also yeah. was a producer on our, our latest feature, but he was, yeah, he was in the play and Dave yes. was a was a theatre play, right? Although he'd done some bits of screen. 
and then he was adapting it as from his script yeah his his so it's a bit of like an amalgamation of like so you can be a writer producer and a director or you can just be one of each you're just very I I like to think that the UK are better at, at accepting the hyphen or the forward slash um, like they do in America, you know, there's there's something powerful to be able to do more than one thing in this in this industry, and I think you you have to be in a position to be able to do what more than one thing. Uh, but in particular, as as us as producers, to speak candidly, it's our job to manage egos as well, and um, and to make sure everyone is happy. And that's why Sarah very rightly said we are mothers. We we are in mm. in. in in all the you know in all the joy that brings and also in all the um yeah tantrums. <laughs> and I'd say that producer as well it's like really important to they they oversee you know you might have um a very like a, a the writer writes one version of the film and then the director has like another version of that film and and directs and shoots it in a certain way and then I'd say that it's then cut in the edit as another version and it kind of goes through these three stages and as a producer like April said you manage egos you manage sort of desires and visions and try and get people to think collaboratively of the same vision I think a lot of the time like the director's vision tends to lead throughout on both film and tv I think it does come down to what they want and how they direct it there and then then the producer ultimately has like it's like a bird's eye view it's they always have to have in mind what is the broadcaster wanting or what is the distributor wanting or how am I going to sell this and what is the genre and are we shooting this in the way that it should be shot so it's legally compliant so it you know it it we everything's there's all the clearances done that's when you have like products in and different brands and you've got everything cleared in the location agreements but also is it ultimately becoming what you hoped it would be or better than you hoped it would be um, and and managing that sort of journey, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to throw in a couple of rude words here. I'm so oh. sorry. <laughs> um, but difficult people and saying no. Um, obviously, you'll work in the industry where there are lots of characters from <laughs> different backgrounds and, you know. But mm. what I was going to say was, you know, as a producer, um, is there any sort of... Any has there been any examples where you've had to tell a director or a writer, no, we're not doing that? And how has that been? And what advice do you have for up and coming filmmakers or filmmakers? Um, you know how to kind of put their foot down. How how do you mm. think it's best to go around that? Do you want to speak first, Apes? Or right? We've probably got different tactics. On this, we do. Which is we why have it's good. We have different tactics, and I tell you what, I have I have really learned how to hold my own and be more confident and assertive as the years go by. And actually, when we made that short film, Edith, one of the exec producers, Fiona Nielsen, who is a producer in her own right, and she's fierce and she's amazing. She's, we sat down with her and we were young producers and I remember sitting down being like, wow, she'd be like, no, no, yes. Like she was just, she had so much confidence and knowledge. And I remember looking at her being like, how can I be like you? Like, what have you got to being like that? <laughs> Um, And the more shows I do and the more pressure and the bigger the budgets, I really learn the sort of jeopardy, jeopardy, legal jeopardy, compliance, what you're accountable for. And I, especially as a line producer, co-producer, I I have to say no quite a lot when it's money stuff and we can't afford it. The way I navigate it is, is staying extremely calm. I don't really, I don't think I've ever shouted at somebody or raised my voice and always try to get them to sort of understand and see why. And I normally go down the angle of like, I'm really sorry. It's just a no. <laughs> like, but I, I just, uh, that's my, that's how I, def- I, I, that's just my temperament. Um, uh, and some people find it much easier to be a lot, a lot more f- forceful and bold, uh, but like, and also if you're yeah. quite close to someone like with Chris, Christian on embers, we're kind of mates of them as well. So I, we could be a bit more like handed. Like, <laughs> didn't we, April? Course, we were just course. like, mm-hmm. what about you, April? What do you think? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, what about you, April? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm certainly, uh, like likewise with Sarah very much learning what can now stand my own but I um I hate confrontation I mm. you know wherever possible also creatively we of course want to be able to 
execute exactly what people want to execute. That's um, that's that's probably why we wanted to produce the script in the first place. Um, we, we've learned over the years, nine times out of 10, people just want to be seen and heard. Yeah. So if you give them the time and space to explore that idea, hear them run, go through the motions, then you can gently make coax them round to an an idea and and I tend to I'm 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 a very I'm 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 the most informal professional person you'll ever come across uh to an extent and I think my tactic is always to slowly kind of drip feed something so that then they think it's their idea to do what me and Sarah <laughs> that want. Old, that old yeah, tactic. Yeah, no, yeah, we do we do that. get funny about different things being able so I'll be like absolutely no and she'll be like mm. and vice versa we're like so will I like send one of us in <laughs> and then we'll use yeah. the other as backup good top back yeah, top, well. top, top, top. Yeah, that, yeah. that would work Brilliant. it's hard okay. <laughs> let's talk about distribution now I don't know much about distributing films because I'm a TV bod you see and I just know about channels and commissioners and all that kind of stuff so Tell us, how many films have you been involved in in regards to distributing? And what are the different types of distribution? I know you can distribute films in the film festival circuit, but how does Mm -hmm. that kind of work together in regards to film distribution? Just kind of inform us more about that. This is what I love. I love this side of of it. I think it's um I think it's so much fun. And and I think this is why Sarah and I work so well together because we 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 cover the entire journey of of a film and from the get-go even from that first big short film T for Two we're always thinking about what's the story outside the story like what is our audience how are we going to get eyes on it and there's a lot of directors out there guys who and it's very noble they want to put every penny on the screen and we always Mm. say that's great but who the hell is going to see it if you don't keep money uh, budgeted for four festivals, four a trailer, four posters, Uh, you know, just starting an Instagram account or a Facebook page isn't enough. And and also is actually, I think, a bit counterproductive because you don't really get new followers uh, going that way. But in terms of us distributing, we just always wanted to uh, make sure that we could find the biggest audience because with the way that Sarah and I um, continued with Mini, we produced a, a slate of short films that are all different genres you know from period to lgbt to drama to sci-fi and that is because we wanted to a learn what we liked what was what was our passion what stories did we want to tell but also we wanted people to start recognizing our company on festival circuits and there are there are mainstream festival circuits but horror lgbtq plus in particular have their own festival circuits that you could just go on a horror festival circuit if you wanted to um and also i just personally i i actually took i i worked at lff for four years and um i did that i was part of the social media and i was producing red carpet content and doing that for them for four years so uh, and I purposely went and did that so I could learn more about the distribution side of things. So anyway, just uh, to your question, Georgina, um, we've distributed all of our short films, uh, bar maybe one that had like a limited um, distribution period of time because of music licensing. And we found distributors, there are distributors, granted it was in America, who uh, acquired short films and um and distributed them on our on our behalf and so we have five six on amazon prime and there are loads of short film platforms out there now and yeah our mm. films are all over the internet and in different territories but what, what i i would just say what april's very good at <laughs> is also emailing the festivals and building a rapport and like if we've got two shorts on trying to get a two for one and trying to see if they've got discounts or if they can support and also targeting your festival strategy so that you are spending the money where it's worth where it's like got maximum sort of worth so not just being like oh I'm going to hit all the big festivals and I just hope I get in it's like okay well let's look at those festivals and say 
have they screened a short that's about mm. sort of love and friendships in the past three years is it actually got a chance because you can just waste mm-hmm. 50 quid so quickly um and that goes you know then the same with our feature films it's it's festival what's its big festival because it's an indie feature it's not a major motion picture like barbie where it's got a marketing budget of like multi multi millions you go what's what's the festival circuit what's the best festival we can get into so for our first feature it was it was lff and so you know it was hard lockdown it was devastating we did it on zoom and uh, f- film premiering at lff and we were sat on zoom with like the top half dressed in black tie and the bottom in pajamas i mean when we like took them off to go to go like black tie off at like 9 p.m and just sat in our pajamas but um you know and then and then that got nominated for a biffa and so then from that all that sales and distribution it happened more organically because it had been sort of got press and recognition um and you can do the same with your short films build up that Mm. hype and that little festival circuit and go that way it definitely feels like there's an element of producers being a little bit fearful to to dive into that distribution side of things they think if they just hand over a, a completed film but actually if you take the time to think i mean most recently blimey barbie jesus they oh, really good. they were thinking from day one granted it was a solid ip but yeah. if you start thinking about you know even sarah and i read a script and we're like firstly do we like it and then secondly how do we how do we position this how do we sell it and it it can just be wrong time wrong place in terms mm. of genre and, and topic and then we we move on but i really do uh implore that producers start thinking about that even even think about it in the way that you search for your projects think about Mm. what is popular at the moment um yeah definitely what are those platforms that you mentioned for those who are looking for film festivals to insert their films in what are the best you know platforms that people can use for that film freeway film freeway is is hands down the best um they do they also do gold memberships for a yearly uh yearly fee which brings everything down a bit um really accessible and and actually the majority of the festivals are on there there are some there are a couple of biggies like your venices and your berlins who yeah, can uh, is direct isn't it can is also direct um yeah. so yeah you have to kind of sign up or you'd sign up to festival newsletters i always say what's the other platform mate film freeway and isn't there another film depot Film Depot, that is. It's 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 good. She does the um, festivals. <laughs> it's just a little bit. It's a little bit uh, not user as user friendly. Sure. Um, but yeah, I again encourage you guys to sign up to all the newsletters of of the festival. Do you get spammed a bit? Yeah, but you don't want to miss a, a golden moment. Sure. And also, whilst we're talking about it, sign up to Deadline and Variety bulletins. You definitely get spammed by them. But especially with the the strikes that are happening in the US, all of this. You might just pick, you might see something that um, is really useful, if nothing else, to drop into conversation when you're networking. Amazing. Now, let's lead on a bit towards careers. What has been your biggest, what has been the biggest change in the industry from where you first started to now? So where's everything heading? Is there been a change in culture? You know, what has been, has there been any changes in terms of operational, like, Just tell us a bit about that in your own words. Mm. Oh, yeah, I definitely think there has been um, in terms of mental health and well-being in the industry. I was literally about to say the same. Yeah, Yeah. because like, so we we piloted the the film and TV charity. If you haven't heard of the film and TV charity, you really need to look them up. They are working for mental health and well-being in the industry. And we piloted their first ever toolkit on two of our shorts that were mental health shorts that April wrote and we filmed in lockdown in COVID times and it was really intense and I think COVID amplified I mean we've been banging on about mental health for the whole time we've been working to, together April and I because we feel incredibly passionately about it and about mm-hmm. treating people very well on sets but all I would hear on you know bigger TV sets oh it's really horrible and oh everyone's mean to each other and I you know you get I've worked on some lovely TV shows, but you do get, there is still a mentality and an old school mentality and a lot of senior 
white men in, in head, heads of departments and there is a sort of like you just need to be resilient and you just need to get on with it type attitude and actually what COVID did was help amplify the conversation and the importance for well-being for anxiety for support and so yeah. now I'm actually working for channels like Sky Studios and ITV Studios and they're bringing in the film and TV charities toolkit when I was doing words or gummage for the BBC I was like oh, we've just use this toolkit on our short films and we really care about it and this is it and it's a mental health risk assessment and luckily I had an amazing other head of production Gary Matzel who was like yeah okay let's just try it out and we had to I had to sort of persuade the people higher up to just let me use it and it'll be don't you don't even have to think about it it'll be really easy but luckily somebody like Gary um was really and open to saying fine. Yes, yeah. we can use this. And now it's in every channel. Now it's like mm. part of the infrastructure. So when I go to a company, they're like, oh, have you heard of film TV show? I'm like, yes. Yeah. They're like, oh, we, you know, this is our well-being memo. And these are our links to support crew. And here's the free counseling they can get when they work on this production. And who's our well-being facilitator and who's our mental health risk um first aider? Mm. Just mm. having those conversations. And certainly some of the topics that I've worked on in shows in the past year have, have been very intense topics about suicide and, you know, death and fraud. And they're, they're heavy topics that do affect the crew that work on them. Um, so that, mm. for me, has been the biggest change because I think it's been like well needed, a well needed change. I think that's also a good example of how you know we're we're mini but we're mighty and we we <laughs> dived in straight as as actors and producers and then later down the line went well oh, we should probably learn what everyone else does as well <laughs> as well <laughs> um but you know like Sarah said Sarah was the one to bring that toolkit to the attention of of you know channels um so it always trickles down from the top even if your top is not as high as as another top Sure. And I think it is highly important, you know, definitely from a mental health well-being angle for everybody, you know, it's something that's very key and important. OK, so I'm going to just remind the audience as well, if you've got any questions, feel free to add them in the um, Q&A chat box um, and we'll go through them towards the end of the session. But I have another question. As an up and coming producer or even a producer with some experience in film and TV, for those who are listening, what is the most effective way to look for paid projects? And mm. how does this differ between film and TV? So are you saying jobs in the film and TV industry yeah. that are paid? Or are you saying like projects that have money attached to them, like if you're a filmmaker? I would say if you are a any like anyone who just wants to kind of like make films or produce mm. TV... How do you think is the best route for them into the industry to find paid work, whether they're oh, okay. themselves or whether they're actually working for a production company or a film house? Like, yeah, how do you think is the best sort of career path for them or ways to get into getting paid work for them? OK, well, I I think so. We so I work like seven days a week for six years whilst we were building mini and I would work on weekends to pay my rent we do all our projects and they would be all you know like our own passion projects and we would be raising the money as producers and it might take six months it might take a year and a half or whatever it did so then I would just try and do any work I could to make our projects and then actually did a lot of free work being a runner or whatever or doing helping out on someone's film and networking but I think if you want to now like having working in tv and th working in tv and thinking about the opportunities out opportunities out there screen skills is amazing and they offer definitely like entry level positions trainee positions I always have screen skills trainees on my um high-end tv shows because that they, they get they pay a levy that that means that they you know they really encourage it and they also do like step up opportunities so if you're trying to step up in a role and work your way up but also production base has a lot of production jobs and film and tv jobs I know there's lots of Facebook groups film and tv Facebook groups mm -hmm. but then again I would say those networks you know like the BFI film academy and then if you got into BFI network and the BAFTA crew all that stuff you can apply to then a lot of the time those networking groups can become your network and then there's suddenly a paid short film opportunity you know 100 200 quid a day can you come and help out or I need a DP and that that will work does 
build up as well. And a lot of our friends in this industry have established themselves as filmmakers through those sorts of jobs. Amazing. Do you have anything to add on that, April, before I go to the next question? It's it's a little bit... Oh, I'm trying to... I'm trying to... Well, it's, I, I think it know what you want and don't go down the obvious route to get it that's how you also find um find money i know that sounds stupid but like for example wanting to produce um and then me going to work at the bfi london film festival which is completely it was an amazing experience i had the best time all four years it was brilliant so um even if you want to be on set even if you want to you know want to be a producer or a director or a writer really think about the the, the festivals and, and and maybe working in there um if you want more of a short term uh a short term contract besides that just be open minded to to the, the more unusual things to produce you know reality tv music videos commercials vr now like events even produce events so there's have as many strings to your bow as possible Brilliant. And what's the best way to pick up important skills as being a producer? So what's the best way to pick up skills? Obviously, you know, you would have to, you know, build up your experience by, would you say volunteering is a thing these days? Or would you just say go for paid work? Like, in terms of, you know, developing your skills, if you want to be a producer, and you may not have, you might have limited experience or none at all. How do people get started? I think learn under someone good. <laughs> I think go and work, even if you said I'll do a day for free under somebody that you really want to work mm-hmm. for, really want to help out. Shadow brilliant people, learn from people above you that you respect. Also, I actually learned a lot working when I have, uh, uh, how do I say this actually? Sometimes as a line producer, I've worked for producers that wouldn't produce how I would produce, but it's affirmed how I want to produce. Mm -hmm. and so that is in itself an interesting experience because there's always something to learn like you if you have more variety and you work with different people you work out how you like to do things and your own identity and what you and and the best methods and the best templates and the best systems if you only work for one company or one thing or one way I don't think that it opens your mind up to sort of the possibilities um, of Mm -hmm. learning I, I was going to say, don't be afraid to mess up and fall flat on your face. Like Sarah and I have had to learn the hard way and we look back on some of the things and we laugh. Uh, <laughs> but that's how you learn the most, definitely. Um, but yeah, I agree with what Sarah said. Fantastic. Cool. So you've actually collaborated with the BFI Film Academy previously. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about what you did and why you think programmes such as those offered by the Film Academy for young screen creatives looking to enter the industry are beneficial to take part in? Yes, we made mm. short films. It was great. Yeah. We did it over <laughs> the summer. Tour, didn't we? It was so nice. They like came up with an idea and a script and we had small groups and we were in, you know, we were at Eastside um education uh, building and um we we yeah came up with the idea filmed the shorts with them they put it all together had a little screening and it was so good again to like work I think it was like I don't think they all knew each other did they apes you, you get to meet yeah. new filmmakers we did some talks as well about um producing and different filmmaking techniques and stuff so um I think they run so many interesting courses, but it was brilliant because it was like, then all those young people had that first thing on their CV, which I often look for if I'm bringing on trainees or entry level positions, that they've made a few shorts themselves. I think that's wonderful. And it helped get a first credit and go through that process. So yeah, it was great. Fantastic. So just tell us a bit about the BFI opportunity that may be up and coming. I believe I've heard through the grapevine that there is an opportunity mm-hmm. there. So feel free to elaborate. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we take are, that one as well? Yeah, we're collaborating with Rose Bruford. Um, and we it's the opportunity to sort of work with us and be mentored with us. We're looking for um, up and coming producers um, who 
yeah, want to be mentored by us to make a feature film with Rose Bruford, who have put some money aside to make a feature for their graduate students. So they are, um, it's the BA Honours Acting degree, and uh, we'll be filming a feature over two weeks. Um, so, and it's a paid opportunity, and it would be sort of working in pre-production with us, being there on the shoot, and then obviously being a part of the conversation um, of finishing the film, and there'll be a little screening and stuff. So we're kind of looking for anyone that, may have made their own shorts or, or worked on shorts a little bit before and, and really wants to be a pr producer or work in production um, and then have the experience of making a feature so a, a longer piece of content and um, yeah that's it really but it'll be on the we'll, we'll be advertised um, probably in the very end of this month so the end of August and it'll look out on the BFI Film Academy socials and our socials probably at Mini as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So I think that wraps us up. Wraps us up. That <laughs> wraps us up nicely. And yeah. um, I think we're going to start with the QA session. Um, there has been quite a few questions, like millions and millions and millions. So please forgive me, please forgive me if I'm not able to, an to ask your question. Um, so first I'm going to start with a lady called Emily Esharaji. She has asked, what are your favorite types of projects to work on? And that's for you both. You can don't go for apes. What's your favorite type of project? Uh, <laughs> as in like actual projects, like as in like film, TV, um, commercials, all that, or type of, type of content. Because for me, um, I, I like content that makes me feel seen, um, because I grew up uh, as an only child, so I, and I do think we take for granted how much film and TV educates us. So I did learn a lot, and um, and the types of projects that Sarah and I, I, I went on to make and continue to make is content we wish we had seen growing up um, as a bisexual and someone uh, who came out later in life and got diagnosed with bipolar later in life. If I'd seen myself on screen. I think I would have come to those conclusions a lot quicker. Um, also, we would really love to make the next Miss Congeniality and a Christmas film. Oh, we're desperate to. Next Miss Congeniality. I know. Mm, yeah, <laughs> One <great>. day. <laughs> oh, bless um, yeah. Okay. Um, we're twins, by the way. We're actually twins. I love it. <laughs> so, um, so I've got another question from Arlo Hay. What would your day-to-day -day responsibilities look like as a producer? I think we've kind of covered that. What kind of jobs would you have to complete for every project? So let's just say about hmm. five things you would do as a producer. Let's just list some off. Okay. So I would say day-to-day -day is um, the producer is like always on hand for that there are sort of compliance and legal stuff but basically making sure that you're doing everything legally properly and everybody is being looked after and sort of the running of the set is working seamlessly um you'd also watch the rushes every day so even when we're shooting whether we're shooting one of our indie features and we have an editor there every day or when i'm in tv and film you know those they call them dailies but from the day before the editor will be processing them and you sit and watch them and you make sure that you know no one was in the back of shot that shouldn't have been and we captured everything we needed to and didn't need to do pickups and all that sort of stuff um also script notes so a lot of the a lot of the time producers in development and when you're shooting if there's new sides coming out and new um bits of writing or if you're doing a feature and you're in development giving script notes to the writer and working collaboratively with the writer um overseeing the crewing up as well of the team and the heads of the department making sure that you have a cohesive team that are all working together and talking um and then reporting to the financiers or the execs um and checking in with the budget and making sure everything's running properly it's basically what a production manager does in tv too so <laughs> yeah yeah totally love it Okay, cool. So um, Kit Taylor has a question, which is a wonderful question. I might chip in on that one, actually. It says, I love networking and think it's brilliant, but so many opportunities are expensive, i.e. Mm. Edinburgh TV Festival, and aren't friendly for people starting out from a working class background. False. Um, yeah. Preach. Yeah, so it's a I massive problem. It, it is an issue. Um, there are lots, lots of networking events on Eventbrite. So mm. even if you search oh, film, 
that are free, that are really like five pounds or 10 pounds or something like that. If you yeah. literally just search TV and film networking or TV networking, film networking, that's a really good platform. Also screen skills as well, like you said before, mm -hmm. I think that's really good. It's a good platform for like training and just general advice and events and stuff. The RTS, which is the Royal Television Society, they have amazing, um, like really like, I think it's like 10 pound like tickets for um, networking events. So I would say, you know, I'm from a working class background, so I'm with you. Um, so I think just try and go to as many networking events as possible. Yeah. Uh, and I'd also say try and go within your area. So, right, I live in, mm. I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Shropshire, right? So my nearest city is like Birmingham or Cardiff, maybe Manchester, but also I've got a town, Shrewsbury town, sort of like a small town, but this is nothing around. But it's like, what is your nearest city or area? Because of the major cities, they have like, there's the Yorkshire Film Fund, there's Manchester, there's Manchester's a massive hub for film and TV, Cardiff. So finding your nearest city or area and then trying to hook up with networks there because that could be cheaper than like, I mean, it's expensive for anyone living in London to go to Edinburgh. That's so expensive, but it's mm. like, what are within your radius and what are those networks and can you hit them up and can you arrange a networking night? Can you link with local filmmakers? Like, can you take stuff into your own hands? So yeah, there's all those bigger hubs that you can build up to, but if you need something more immediate and local, I think it's trying to think about your local networks and how you can maybe reach out or, you know, maximize them. Likewise with film festivals, there are mm. so many film festivals um, out, in, out in the regions now. And in particular, so the director and writer of T for Two, Mark Brennan, started his own film festival called x66 yeah. in basingstoke and that festival has gone on and is like i can't remember like it's, it's great. fifth year it's and amazing. it's become wonderful and massive mm. and like has so many networking events and so many nurturing um, elements to it as in and it's in basingstoke and industry like, professionals are going to it like people yeah. that are like would go to the big ones are also going there because their films are screened there so actually mm. what are your local film festivals and can you go to them um quite cheaply brilliant cool hopefully that's answered your question um we've got another question from caitlin stewart for insurance such as public liability insurance what <laughs> advice do you have please to get the most cost effective one for small budget short films hmm that's this a, really a bit question. of a journey for us wasn't it yeah we actually had an insurance broker a very sweet one a regional one i would say regional was my, is yeah. cheaper <laughs> if you yeah. go for a london insurer it's just going to be more expensive yeah and he was your dad's insurer wasn't he Apes? and then he was my dad's broker yeah yeah and then they paired up so with they like, sorry just to just to clarify they had never done um media insurance before so they <laughs> were actually learning with us um mm. sorry continue sir no and they um they just they started a film and tv arm because we, we we talked to them about it and they were like oh hang on we can let's research that what that is and what coverage you need so it was very sweet but we actually got quite cheap insurance for many years um they are what was their film and tv branch called now it's the film and media it's film performance, performance oh, media. I've mm. seen their names a lot in a lot of WhatsApp groups. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because they've now started pushing, and they actually do very cheap insurance. So it's performance yeah. media insurance. Um, we can find their like details, but they do quite cheap insurance for smaller companies because they they started doing they do insurance for small businesses, and then they went into film and TV to try and make it affordable. So I would say that that would be an affordable, element. but. Uh, Otherwise, also like go go compare and stuff. Like I'm sure if you put in enough search engines, you can find as long as you've got the right coverage, um, mm -hmm. you can probably find it cheaply. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so Daisy has asked, "What do you like to see in a director writer? What do you Passion. like to see?" <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Passion, man. love excitement <laughs> it, it's got to, you've got open to have mind that open mind yeah and you've got to have that resilience as well you've got to really 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 want it especially in short films sometimes it might take you a year three years to make a short I mean we've got a friend who's written a feature that I swear we will make it one day and he's brilliant and he sat down the other day for a drink and he's like I'm saving up for that feature that you budgeted for me I'm gonna I'm gonna make it like it's just the 
in the the passion is the endurance it's the one the, the desire to keep making and keep caring that that's what I always look for <laughs> perfect um Beth Chapman has asked what do you what what do you see the industry trending towards the future format wise? Short form versus long form. Example, the mini short chop seems very in line with changing attention spans. Are you looking for more media like this? More mm. looking for more digestible media like this? In terms of formatting and- Do you know what? Yeah, it, really, it, it, it depends on the channels. And it depends. The channels are all changing. They they all went broadcast linear, like linear to now. They're all online. So you know, if you look at BBC Three or you look at some of the short form for Channel Four, like the more that demand comes, the more there's a need for that consumable content. But equally, people are making films that they're putting on YouTube and um, mm. on socials and stuff. So it is an ever evolving space. And weirdly, Netflix yeah. with their TV series, their episodes sometimes are as long as a feature film now. So theatrical features are cut they are dying out and the need for content is changing but I'd say that it's in the hands of the big streamers because they are kind of they're calling the shots in terms of what the, the future of content programming is I think they are indeed. yeah we are in no man's land at the moment and I feel mm. I hope we can find a happy medium again because uh, the chop there aren't plenty of festivals with categories for shorts that are under five minutes under 60 seconds and and for shorts, you can get super creative. And, you know, there's the chop is one long punchline, essentially. Uh, and that's that's a talent and a skill in itself. But it's, I mean, theatrical, when I was working at the cinema, I saw, I'm just giving away my age, I saw them go from actually um, projecting on film to then going to digital and COVID didn't help. And now for some reason, we're, we've the features in in cinemas are three hours which is also turning the cinema into a, a day event not just like I'm going to pop to the cinema so I'm hoping we'll come back and find a happy medium. Mm. I would just say one, one more thing on that is that I when I worked in-house as I had a production at a place called Studio 71 and they repped YouTubers and um, online like people that that were like sort of famous social media um, people, uh, they 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 commissioned shows from YouTube stars and people that had made bite-sized comedy shorts that they had literally just filmed with like their phone or a cheap camera, and then got loads of YouTube views. So that is an in because that platforms like BBC Three and some of the online versions of channels um, or broadcast channels do look for up-and-coming talent. If you can make your name as comedy performers or you're making short shorts that have like an, an IP or like a theme I've seen channels well production companies develop ideas and pitch them to channels and actually get them made as like sometimes a mini series that then goes to series that you know even Fleabag was a Edinburgh show so um it's like finding what your thing is and what you want to make um and just keep going <laughs> right hopefully that was helpful for you Okay, so we've got Comfort M. I have recently produced my first student short film as a writer director. I would like to distribute it to festivals, but I have limited budget. What would be the best strategy for distributing it? I know we have spoken a bit about film festivals already, but for, for someone who literally doesn't really have much budget, is there a, another way or is there any invented April. way? April there are there are a lot of free festivals out there um if mm. you if you have a look and um depending on your sorry did you say it was a, a student film yes uh, a student film yes yeah first student films a uh, student there's there's a lot a lot of student categories and they're either free or very cheap um and for first time filmmakers as well um uh be be realistic with with what you want to achieve with it and and I always find that we've had films where we haven't had a huge amount of budget to put behind festivals but then our goal became just get as many eyeballs on it um you know get get some get some laurels attached to that poster uh and there are they're few and far between but have a good google there are some um grants available for, for festivals out there. Uh, we tend to keep 
a, a thousand pounds aside into a budget ideally but really you can get you can do a lot with 200 pounds even 150 brilliant thanks for that now this is the last question guys as we are coming to a wrap so apologies if i didn't have the opportunity to um say your question but please do feel free to you know follow the ladies on social media and you know um, maybe ask them that way um perhaps but there is a question and it is from an anonymous attendee <laughs> do you have any advice on moving from one side of the industry to another i've been working in post-production but i'm mm. interested in moving into production and producing yes so i would say um make a move uh is part of screen skills and they support people either stepping up or stepping across in roles so i would de again definitely go back to screen skills if it's sort of more developed paid opportunities um i think sometimes you have to be prepared to step down sometimes mm -hmm. if you've got a bit of up that. in post-production we actually had some of our dear friends who worked at a post house um who then <laughs> had all the skills as post producers to work in production and we were like you just need to you could totally do it and we actually introed them to a pm who was working in fact and and they transitioned across into production that way um, but also writing to indie companies and seeing if they've got any opportunities. And I'd also say if you are a filmmaker as well, making your own films and then, you know, they can all they can be part of your CV and they can be part of accompanying like your work and proving that you can work on that side, too. So there are a few routes, but um, I hope that's kind of helpful. Was... Yeah, I think that was. Do you have anything to add? Well, I think I that's pretty spot on. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Great. So is there any more, like any last words before we close at all from the guys? Any sort of words of inspiration, motivation to get people inspired? <laughs> Never give up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, let no fuel you. You're going to hear no a lot. Just do it out of spite. Just um, crack yeah. on. Uh, yeah. Persistence is key. Know what you want. Um, and yeah just don't just don't take no for an answer yeah which has definitely been our ethos and I'd also add to that which is something that I really have lived by now since I got told this saying by my brother a few years ago is problems don't age well and I think when you're working in this yeah. industry the, the earlier that you deal with a situation and manage it the the quicker stuff gets resolved and I sort of live by that as I go further along and our projects mm -hmm. get bigger it's like you know that problems don't age well and deal with those situations and those people as quickly as possible so that you can keep growing and moving forward mm. but also remember as producers you know you, you are your worth is massive and if you if you want to tell a story you don't have to wait for a writer or director to come to you you can tell that story that's what sarah and i have started doing recently and that's why i've stepped into yeah. writing taking it into well. your own hands absolutely yeah yeah and your voice is necessary as producers you you yeah yeah, yeah. and you need as well it's like what is your unique voice think about that and let that guide you a hundred percent oh it's been emotional <laughs> baby. i absolutely <laughs> loved hearing your stories your answers it's been so informative and i hope for everyone listening you've really been sort of listening really intently and like taking sort of like mental notes as to where you are in your career because i believe in every single one of you i know you can all make it in the industry definitely um, you know, everyone has their own paths, but it's yeah. just so important to just never give up, honestly, and just Definitely. keep plugging away at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can do well, it. Thank you. Can. Yeah. And thank you exactly. so much for having us. We really appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Um, so that's the <laughs> Powerhouses Lab, the roles of producers in film and TV. I've been Georgina Bob, and it's been a great pleasure to be hosting this evening's session. Thank you so much for watching this BFI Film Academy Lab session on producing for film and television. We run monthly live digital labs events and would love to see you at our next one on Monday, the 18th of September. It will be all about financing for your short films and it will be delivered by one of our partners, Queen's Film Theatre and Nerve Centre on behalf of Film Hub Northern Ireland. To find out more about this session, visit our lab's webpage, which you can find in this video's YouTube description and also follow BFI Film Academy on our social channels.
Thank you so much and see you next time.